let me just give you the short version of his biography. Uh, Henry's, Henry Junon's life is a study in contrasts. He was born into a wealthy home, but died in a hospice. In middle age, he juxtaposed great fame with total obscurity and success in business with bankruptcy. In old age, he was virtually exiled from the Genevan society of which he had once been an ornament, and he died in a lonely room, leaving a bitter testament. His passionate humanitarianism was the one constant in his life, and the Red Cross, his living monument. And this comes from the website of the Nobel Prizes, as Dunant was the joint winner of the very first Nobel Peace Prize in 1901 for his work in founding the Red Cross. Now, what's omitted from this epitaph, from the Nobel website, is the other great constant of his life, without which you can't really make sense or understand all his humanitarian work. And of course, the other great constant was his Christian faith. And uh, when you go to the Red Cross Museum or whatever, when it talks about Dunant, barely mentions, if ever, his faith. And yet, when you look at his life, you'll see how extremely important it was, not just in his personal motivation, but in how, what he brought, uh, the experience he had uh, uh, in missions, if you like, um, he brought into his um, vision and understanding of how the Red Cross could function. So, what is the story behind this remarkable Swiss man who founded the Red Cross movement and which led to Geneva becoming the heart of the United Nations and the international NGO capital? Most Christians have never heard of him. So let's uh, dive in. Jean-Jacques Dunant and his wife Antoinette Colladon were from eminent Genevan families. To be Genevan meant to be Protestant and Calvinist, and they were particularly devout, uh, committed to demonstrating their faith through social engagement. On 8th of May 1828, John Henry was born, the oldest of their five children. Growing up, he accompanied his mother in visiting poor families and prisoners, and he went to the Collège Calvin, the secondary school uh, founded by the great reformer himself, Calvin, in the 1550s, and it's still a secondary school in Geneva today. Um, and Dunant, the young Henry, he distinguished himself by winning prizes for piety, kind of religion, RE, three times in three different years, but he was forced to leave the college when he was 14. Uh, for repeatedly failing his year-end exams. So Dunant was a school dropout. Um, but during his school term at the college, he used to go to his aunt Sophie's house for lunch each day. She was an active member of the Société Évangélique de Genève, that's the Geneva Evangelical Society, which had been formed in 1831 by members of the Evangelical Réveil, that's Revival Movement, which had begun uh, about 30 years later. Um, and their main church was the Oratoire in uh, Rue Tabazan in old, the old city of Geneva, which is still an evangelical church today. Uh, photo taken by me. So that's how it looks. Well, 10 years ago it did anyway. Um, and there are both French and English speaking congregations there. Now that Reve movement, that evangelical revival movement uh, of the 18... Um, sort of 20s and 30s and 40s. It focused on the simple gospel, faith in Christ's atoning work, the authority of scripture, and the need for personal conversion. And it had broken, up, broken away from the Swiss Reformed Church, the one that dated back to Calvin and the Reformation, which of course had broken away from the uh, Catholic Church, you know, through the, the Reformation. So... Um, but, but that Swiss Reformed Church, the Calv Calvin's Protestant Church, had become in itself rather institutionalized, cold. And in fact, when the, the guy who really brought the, that revival to, that Reve movement to Geneva, he was a Scotsman called Robert Haldane. Uh, and when he came in around 1816 to Geneva, um, and he met with some theology students, um, and he asked them, well, what do you study? Uh, you're, you're stu you're, studying theology to be, be trained as pastors. He said, do you read the Bible? And they said, oh, no, no, we don't read the Bible. Uh, only the Psalms. It's the only part of the Bible they read, studying theology. All the rest was philosophy. So um, he said, well, do you want to know what the Bible says? And so he began to lead them in a study of Romans, and then some of those students came to 
faith in Christ, and uh, they you know, grew and flourished, and that's how the Reveille movement began. Um, now, um, because Aunt Sophie used to, was part of this, young Henry would, would, was drawn into that community of the Reveille, uh, the Reveille Church at, um, uh, at the Oratoire here. But it was in the summer of, 19, uh, sorry, of 1847, the 19-year-old Junon was walking in the Alps with two friends when he had something of a conversion experience. And subsequently, the three of them set up something called the Réunion de Jeudi, which is the Thursday Association, and that gathered young men for weekly Bible study and prayer. This grew steadily under their leadership, and they began connecting with similar groups which were forming and growing up in other towns. Junon also joined something called the Arms Society, which was a bit like he had done as a child with his mother, visiting the poor, uh, a prison visiting on Sunday afternoons, where he read the Bible with condemned prisoners, and also told them stories of travel and adventure, because that was what he dreamed about um, as a child. Now, evangelism and social work didn't earn a living. So, age 21, Junon was apprenticed to uh, a banking firm called Lulin and Sauter uh, in Geneva, and as some of the directors of that company had links to the Reveille movement as well. Now, his work responsibilities took him to France, where he was able to visit some of the groups of young Christians he had been corresponding with. And in 1851, the Thursday Association sent two medical students to Paris to organize similar ga uh, gatherings. And Junon visited the Netherlands, too, and helped to encourage a new group there. So he was having a growing international influence. Um, and he would write prolifically. He was a great correspondent. Um, at one time, he uh, was writing to, I think, uh, 30 different, holding correspondences with 30 different cities, groups in 30 different cities all around Europe and right as far as Beirut um, in Lebanon. Um, and his style, he, he wrote inspired by the kind of the epistles in the New Testament. So he, he had a very sort of... Um, uh, if you like, Pauline, Pauline style of, of you know, greeting and encouraging and, and staying true to the faith and so on. He was a great little evangelist. He was a YWAMer, except YWAM had not been invented back then. I say that because I spent 20 years in YWAM. So that's one of the reasons why I think I can, I can relate to this guy. Anyway, um, so the following year, 1852, uh, the, um, this association, this Thursday association in Geneva was renamed the Union Chrétienne de Jeunes Gens. So that's the uh, Christian Union of Young Men. And their original meeting place uh, is marked by this spot. There's the young Dunant around that time, and it said the Union Chrétienne de Jeunes Gens in Geneva was an initiative of Henry Dunant and Max Perrault, and it was established here in 1852. And that's uh, the street. It's actually in the Rue Calvin in the old city of Geneva. Um, now, Dunant was the secretary of the group and the most active leader. He was recruiting around half the new members. He provided a quarter of the capital to set it up. And the group was organized and run by the young people themselves for prayer, Bible study, um, growing in their faith, and organizing evangelistic outreach and practical service. And they also brought together young people running social activities um, uh, to, to you know, Christians from different kind of... Um, Social classes were, were brought together. So it had a, a quite a, a, an effect on the, on the city. Oh, now, all of Junon's spare time and much of his salary went into the work of these Christian unions. And he was fast becoming one of the leading figures in the movement on the continent, particularly because of the correspondence I mentioned. But alongside Junon's gifts were some glaring weaknesses too. So Max Perrault, his co-founder of the Geneva uh, group, he wrote a little while later... He said, my task has not always been an easy one. I had Dunant to restrain. What a pity it is. He is so lacking in judgment. He has amazing zeal and energy. How I wish this dear friend of ours had rather more common sense, tact, and judgment. Now, that's a really important description, a little kind of biography from a, a friend of his at that time, because those kind of character traits are, I think, really instrumental in what happened in the rest of his life. Um, amazing zeal and energy, 
but how I wish this dear friend of ours had rather more common sense, tact, and judgment. So, in 1853, the following year, these Christian Union groups in France, Belgium, and Switzerland, so the French-speaking ones, they were keen to form a federation, an international French-speaking federation of these groups. But Dunant objected, and he proposed there should be one global movement together with the English-speaking equivalent, and they were the YMCA's. So in 1844, George Williams started the first YMCA, which is Young Men's Christian, Asso Christian Association, in London. And by this time, in, by the 1850s, it had spread to the States, to Australia. So there was an international English-speaking network and an international French-speaking network. And they weren't the same organization, but they were very similar in their outlook, in their values, in their, in their goals. So Dunant's, uh, he really appealed that they should form one global alliance, and his argument prevailed, partly because he was writing so frequently about his vision and ideas, and they were published in the international newsletter of these Christian unions. And in the end, this is what happened in 1855, uh, the international YMCA was founded and Dunant helped to write the charter uh, which, which governed it, the rules which kind of governed it, at its first global congress in Paris. But two years earlier, back to 1853, it was a significant year for Dunant in two ways. Firstly, he met the American author Harrier Beecher Stowe in Geneva, the author of Uncle Tom's Cabin. And this book ha had been a runaway bestseller. It had brought the harsh realities of life as an American slave to a wide audience. And through this encounter, Dunant was completely convinced by her arguments and became a firm abolitionist, promoting the cause wherever he went, really, for the rest of his life. Secondly, in that year, Dunant's work with the bank took him to the French colony of Algeria, uh, well, sort of French North Africa in what's kind of now Algeria, um, as a temporary manager for the banks, um, they had um, an enterprise out there called the, the Colonie Suisse de Cetif. It was actually a kind of a settlement of Swiss, um, some Swiss families went to settle in, in that part. I'm afraid it's not on the map, but it's, you know, sort of somewhere here in Algeria. <laughs> I need to find this place a bit more accurately. Um, and despite... Dunant's inexperience, he succeeded really well in his task as a sort of relief manager and was sent out again the following year in 1854. Out there, he became intoxicated with the culture of the Orient and wrote a book which was well received. And through other writings, he began to be seen as a man of letters and was admitted to several learned societies in Geneva, which is a remarkable achievement for someone who dropped out of school aged 14. <laughs> so... Um, now, by the, when he was 27, uh, so that would have been in about um, 1855, Dunant decided to hand over the work of fostering the YMCA branches to others and concentrate on his business career. Because spurred on by this success in managing the work of the bank in Algeria, he thought he could do this himself. And so uh, he set up his own company, and he took a concession on 77 hectares of fertile agricultural land from the French colonial authorities for cultivating wheat. His vision was to grind flour from his own farm and from neighboring ones in a mill, and then to export that flour back to the cities in Europe. This ent enterprise needed a substantial amount of capital, and he used his connections with many of the wealthy families in Geneva and in his parents' circle to raise half a million francs in share capital. And these are some of the certificates that he made. And he tried, he, he designed this thing. This was his company, the Société Anonyme, that's sort of a, a, a limited company, Genevoise, so it's you know, based in Geneva, but it was called Mont Gelmila. And, uh, and, and he created all these lovely sort of inspiring pictures around the, the Shastakut. He was selling this vision of this business. But um, there was a problem. He started to build the mill already for grinding the flour, despite not having obtained permission to access the water that was needed to power the mills and to irrigate the land. 
but he was very confident that he could do it. However, he ran up against the French colonial authorities. And French bureaucrats have not changed in 150 years. Oh, sorry, I must apologize to anyone who's got French uh, blood here. But anyway, it was very slow. It was very, uh, they were not really interested in helping this sort of, you know, enthusiastic young guy from Geneva to start his business. And so um, he, he kept on uh, believing he could overcome these obstacles. And he managed to double the capital of his venture. And... Uh, by going around more investors in Geneva, but downplaying the fact that he still lacked the vital water. Eventually, his impatience with the bureaucracy, the colonial uh, bureaucracy, and slowness of the administration reached the point where he decided to take matters to the top. And he said, who is the head of the French government? It was Napoleon III. So he, he thought, I'm going to present my case to this, this guy here. Well, he did a quick Google search to find out what was happening with uh, <laughs> Napoleon at that time, and he, he found that he was in northern Italy. Uh, so at that time, this is June 1859, Napoleon was in Italy, the north of Italy, uh, having brought the French army to support the um, Sardinian army um, who wanted to drive out the Austrians uh, from northern Italy because they'd occupied that land since 1815. And Dunant arrived in a place called Solferino uh, the day after one of the 19th century's bloodiest battles at, um, at this town called Solferino. Um, that's a sort of a, a couple of pictures, um, a painting of this battle. Uh, it was a horrendous battle. Neither of the sides were particularly well prepared. Um, and the day after, there was just the battlefield was littered. About 6,000 people had been killed, and there were 40,000 who were injured and still on the battlefield after a 15-hour kind of uh, battle on, the, on June the 24th. Um, so many of them were just left to die where they, where they fell. Dunant was shocked, and quickly putting aside his business mission, he immediately got involved, bringing water, arranging supplies, getting the victorious French army to release Austrian doctors that they were holding prisoner, uh, writing down the last words from dying soldiers to send to their families, and mobilizing local people to tend to the wounded uh, from both sides, um, both the Austrian side and the French Sardinian side. Tutti fratelli was the rallying cry. Um, Mercedes is a quarter Italian. She understands all these things. And um, tutti fratelli means, you know, everyone, all are brothers. It doesn't matter what side you had been fighting on. When you're wounded and lying on the battlefield the day after, you're all brothers, as it were, and all worthy of, of compassionate assistance. Um, now, immediately, Junon wrote from Solferino to friends in Geneva, and his appeal for help was published in the local newspaper. And his friends at the Evangelical Society and the church, they quickly formed what was called the Committee for the Wounded, which mobilized material support and sent volunteers to help, so within days of the battle. This, in fact, was the first neutral international mission to help the wounded of, after a war, warfare and could be considered a, a precursor of the Red Cross itself, uh, coming out of an evangelical church in Geneva. Um, and that was especially the case because two members of that ch church committee, Dunant and a young doctor called Louis Appiah, were amongst the five founding members of the Red Cross a few years later. And uh, uh, a historian, uh, Francois Bunion, writes, Altogether, Dunant had only spent about two weeks attending the wounded of the Battle of Solferino, but he had established, without being aware of it, two of the pillars of what was to become the Red Cross and international humanitarian law. And these two pillars were impartiality in the provision of, med uh, in the provision of medical care, doesn't matter who, which side the person had been a combat combatant on. And secondly, the principle of the neutrality of medical action. So over the next two years, Dunant carried on with his, his, with his business in North Africa, but he was haunted by all he had seen and began to think through how the wounded on the battlefield could be helped better. 
And as a result, he published a book called A Memory of Solferino. That's, I think, the original version, and this is the current version in English. Um, and this book, it, he, he, it's, he's a brilliant writer, and he wrote it in three parts. First, he wrote about the battle itself, and accounts he told of tremendous courage, skill, tenacity, and valor. It was somehow the glories of the battle. But then, uh, in all this, in spite of all this, all, all this vivid, vivid description of the battle, he made absolutely no comment at all about the causes of it, nor the political situation which had led to it, or any of the, the, the wider picture around that battle. He just talked about the action itself. But then he abruptly changed his tack, and he writes this. He says, when the sun came up on the 25th, it disclosed the most dreadful sights Im imaginable. Bodies of men and horses covered the battlefield. Corpses were strewn over roads, ditches, ravines, thickets, and fields. The approaches to Sovereigno were literally thick with dead. And so the second part of the book was, he wrote of the hideous aftermath of the battle and the immense suffering of the wounded, so much of which could have been alleviated with a few simple policies and preparations. And so he goes on to the third part, just a short part at the end of the book, in which he sets out a triple appeal. He says, during peacetime, Societies should be formed of volunteers who would, be, who would be prepared to go and assist on the battlefield. Secondly, those volunteer doctors and nurses should be afforded protection and assistance to do this work. And thirdly, governments should formulate certain international principles and conventions which would allow such societies to develop and care for the war wounded in different European countries. So he wrote that his proposal was the adoption by all civilized nations of an international and sacred principle which would be assured and placed on record by an, a convention to be concluded between government, governments. This would serve as a safeguard for all official and unofficial persons uh, engaged in nursing war victims. So Junon printed 1,600 copies of this book in 1862 at his own expense. So this was three years after that battle. And he sent them all around his networks, to the YMCA, to his business circles, to leading families in Geneva, to the royalty and aristocracy. He had quite an address book, I tell you, uh, across different countries. Or even if he didn't know them, he was so bold, he would just write to them anyway. Um, and his challenge stirred many hearts, especially in his own city. And uh, within a matter of uh, months, he had to reprint the book twice. Now, one of the people that, um, was, uh, that read this book was a guy called Gustave Moynier. And he was the president of the Geneva Society for Public Utility. Now, you've got to realize that in the, in the 19th century, if you wanted to solve a problem, you set up a society. I mean, this happened in Britain. It's obviously happening in, in Geneva, France. This was an era of incredible flourishing of NGOs, as we would call them. Um, so you, s you see a problem, let's get a few people together, see how we can solve it, set up a society. So um, this one called the Geneva Society for Public Utility or Public Welfare, it took up this cause and it, they formed a committee in February 1863 to look into the implementation of Dunant's ideas in the book. Dunant was the secretary, he's on the right there. Uh, the, the, Moynier, the, the president, was the guy on the top left there. But the, uh, there was a very eminent General Dufour. He's a Swiss general, army general. And um, he was kind of the, the public figurehead of it. And then there was Louis Appiah, who was the other guy from the Evangelical Churches Committee that in 1859 had actually sent help to Solferino. And another doctor in Geneva called Theodore Monoir. So these were the five people who were in that committee in 1863 to look at these ideas. So Junon was the secretary and devoted himself to mobilizing people around the vision. And in October 1863, so this was sort of um, about um, eight months later, uh, they managed to get the representation, representatives of 14 nations at a conference in Geneva which discussed the 
Improvement of Care for Wounded Soldiers. This really was the birth of the international movement, which adopted uh, the following year the symbol of a red cross on uh, a white background, which was simply the Swiss flag with the colors reversed. Um, and that ended up um, not only becoming the, the symbol of the movement, but it took on its name. Rather than a rather complicated the society for this, that, and the other, it just became the Red Cross. But it was not plain sailing on the committee, though. Moynier was frequently in conflict, conflict with Dunant around the principles and the strategy for setting up the Red Cross. This particularly focused on whether the Red Cross should be neutral. Moynier thought this to be impractical and idealistic. But the more visionary Dunant went, about, went ahead with promoting neutrality as one of the core aspects of, of their work, um, even though the rest of the committee had not approved it. And now, in the end, Dunant's view won out at that 1863 conference, and it became a cornerstone of international humanitarian law, the neutrality of those who are going to assist with the wounded and the dying. Then the following year, 1864, largely through the, the efforts of Dunant, the Swiss Parliament convened an international conference in Geneva on making warfare more humane, and the representatives of 12 nations signed the first Geneva Convention in, um, on the 22nd of August, 1864. So there you have it. That's still in the Museum of the Red Cross, the very first Geneva Convention in kind of governing the rules of war, limiting the atrocities uh, of warfare, and that's the kind of the, the painting done at the time of the people involved in that decision. So this is just 1864, five years after that battle, five years after this naive, enthusiastic um, young businessman who believed that you know almost anything could be done if you put enough energy and enthusiasm into it. He, in five years, he had. Uh, he saw a personal vision transformed into an international treaty. But despite this remarkable success, or perhaps because of it, his business in Algeria continued to flounder. And in 1867, he went bankrupt with losses of over a million Swiss francs. And the trade court in Geneva charged him with deceptive practices around the bankruptcy. There was something which they felt he had done which was, it wasn't just going bankrupt. Honestly, there was, there was some deception there as well. And this, a member of the very respectable sort of elite of Geneva, this was a complete disaster. This was the greatest kind of shame that could happen. It was not only that his personal reputation completely collapsed, but many of his friends and family, they, they lost money because he would persuaded them to put it into uh, the, the, his company. And so his world absolutely fell apart. He was forced to resign from the International Committee of the Red Cross. The CA expelled him as well. And he left Geneva in 80, 1867 and uh, never to return. But there was something more to it than that. He was hounded by Moynier, who continued to discredit him and tried to dissuade Dunant's circle of, of friends from offering him any help. Napoleon III, the emperor he had approached, even offered to pay half his debts, but Moynier managed to thwart that plan as well. Now, despite his exile from Geneva, Dunant was still, still able to initiate and promote a wide variety of causes. And let, I should have made a slide of this, but it's incredible. He started the International Society for Palestine in 1867, concerned by the plight of the Jews and wanting to see them return to Palestine. Theodore Herzl um, called Dunant the first Christian Zionist. Very interesting. He was also involved in starting something called a Common Relief Society after war broke out between Germany and France in 1870. He was involved in starting the Common Alliance for Rules and Civilizations in 1871. He argued for disarmament negotiations and for the erection of an international court to mediate international conflicts. In London, he came to live in London for a bit, he became secretary of the Peace Society there in 1872. And later he worked for the creation of a world library, a dream which was really only fulfilled uh, over a century later by UNESCO. And he often spoke about the influence of three prominent women on his life. 
One we already mentioned, Harriet Beecher Stowe. Another was Elizabeth Fry, who was the great reformer of prisons, and he was, um, he was often visiting prisons in, um, in Geneva, and he heard about Elizabeth Fry's work. And In fact, if you were here at the, the summer school a year ago, we had um, Baroness Julie Smith, who's a Lib Dem peer. She came and gave us a wonderful uh, presentation of the life of Elizabeth Fry. And the third person he, was, he wrote about, perhaps more than anyone else, uh, was Florence Nightingale, um, who, whose work uh, he found hugely inspiring, uh, particularly from, obviously, the work, her work in the Crimean War. But from 1874 onwards, he spent much of the next 20 years in poverty and obscurity, moving from country to country. But in 1887, so when he was... Uh, uh, 59. Uh, he eventually settled in a hospice in a village uh, um, on the German side of German-speaking side of Switzerland called Haydn. This is the building um, <clears throat> uh, where he lived. Apparently, this was a hospice, like an old people's home. It's a rather grand one, uh, and it's uh, been made into the Dunant Museum now. Um, but during this time of, of exile and wandering and poverty, Moynier took advantage of Dunant's misfortune to downplay his, his role and influence in founding the Red Cross to the point when Dunant was virtually written out of the story altogether. Because Moynier was the president of the International Committee of the Red Cross from 1864 when it was started until his death in 1910. So over 50 years he was the... Uh, uh, well, nearly 50 years, he was the president. And he ended up, Moynier, presenting, portraying himself as the sole founder of the Red Cross movement. Uh, and all the history of the Red Cross at that time, you know, it, it showed, you know, that Dunant barely, you know, he was a, had an inspiring idea, but that was about it. But in 1895, uh, Dunant was discovered through a chance encounter or rediscovered, let's say, through a chance encounter with a newspaper editor on holiday from saint Gallen, who published an article about Junon's role in establishing the Red Cross. So Junon's story once again came, came out. And this article was spread around European newspapers, after which he received renewed attention and support. And he was given from then on a number of awards and prizes, culminating in him as we said, being declared the joint winner of the first Nobel Peace Prize in 1901. Yet he never touched the prize money and continued to live in one room of this house in Haydn. Towards the end of his life, he rejected all formalized religion and insisted in his will that he should have no funeral and no mourning, but be carried to his grave like a dog. Yet he held fast to his simple faith and wrote near the end of his life, I am a young disciple of Christ, as in the first century, and nothing more. And to this day, historians are still unraveling the truth about Dunant's real role in the foundation of the Red Cross, as researchers are, are realizing to this day how much of Moynier's version of events influenced the telling of the Red Cross story. So thank you very much.